Uh, hi, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, pleasure and also an honor to be here and to be speaking at the Rosary Rally. Um, my, the title of the talk on the uh, brochures are uh, Mary, the Spouse of the Holy Spirit, and that is going to be the heart of my talk, but I'm going to introduce it by giving a um, very quick run-through of my witness testimony, and um, you'll see why that is the natural prelude to talking about Mary as the, as the uh, spouse of the Holy Spirit. So I'll just pick up sort of where the deacon left off. Um, I was born and raised Jewish. Um, I was very devoutly Jewish growing up and uh, went to Jewish religious education from the beginning of school until university. I lost my faith in God at university. Um, I went to MIT, which is of course a technical scientific university, and I actually absorbed the myth there, the pseudoscientific myth that somehow you have to be ignorant and superstitious to really believe in God. And um, it's just a superstition that people had until they had science to give them all the true answers. Uh, without going too deeply into it, I, I will say that's a pseudoscientific view. It's not at all a scientific view, because the essence of science is you look at the data, you look at the evidence, you form a theory that can explain the evidence. If it successfully explains the evidence, you can hold that theory. If it can't, you have to discard it to come up with another theory that can explain the evidence. And God has given us the gift of a tremendous amount of indisputable physical materialistic evidence for the truths of the Catholic faith. This is the anniversary of the miracle of Fatima. That's obviously one of them, a miracle seen by 70 to 100,000 people, including communists and skeptics and, and cynics who just went there to mock the people who thought there'd be a miracle. Medical miracles of Lourdes, the Eucharistic miracles, including ones in our own time, one in, in uh, 1996 in Buenos Aires, one in 2006 in Poland, which were subjected to full scientific investigation, and lo and behold, the consecrated host had actually turned into human flesh and human blood of a um, heart muscle tissue of someone who died in great agony and so forth. Um, so in fact, if people were really scientific, it would draw them to have to at least uh, entertain the theory that the Catholic faith might be true, and they certainly would have to reject the theory that there's no nothing uh, in the world besides what they can see with their eyes and, and touch with their hands and so forth. Um, G.K. Chesterton has a wonderful quote, rightly or wrongly those who believe in miracles the evidence, and rightly or wrongly those who do not believe in miracles refuse to believe in them on the basis of faith. So I, I won't go down that road any further, but this is the anniversary of, of the miracle of Fatima and um, most of us are probably devout Catholics, and you should never, never, never let anyone um, imply that there's anything superstitious or unscientific about believing in the fullness of the Catholic faith. It is the only scientific response to the evidence before our eyes, both the subjective evidence um, that we have from our own experience of the sacraments, but also actually objective, verifiable, physically observable evidence like miracles. Anyway, however, I lost my faith uh, at university, at MIT. I went on to Harvard Business School. Uh, I, was, I did well enough there that I was invited back to join the faculty. I found myself a newly minted professor of marketing at Harvard Business School at the age of 29. That's really where my witness testimony begins because that's when the bottom fell out of my world because I felt as a child there has to be real meaning and purpose to life. I thought that would come from entering into a personal relationship with God, um, then, uh, which I actually thought would happen at my bar mitzvah, which is like the Catholic confirmation. When that didn't happen, pretty soon I got distracted and thought the meaning of life would come when I began university or when I began my career and so forth. But here I was already more successful than I had expected to be being a professor at Harvard. But there was still no meaning to life, as far as I could tell. I thought we were just a chemical accident. A bolt of lightning hit a puddle of amino acids five billion years ago, and eventually we crawled out. There's no meaning or purpose or pattern to anything. We live and we die, and nothing has any meaning. So I actually, but at this point, there was nothing more I could hope might give my life meaning. There was no greater success out there that I could hope for. So I fell into the worst despair of my life, and in that, I was walking in nature one morning, 
and I received the most spectacular grace of my life. I was just walking along. I had long since given up any hope of the existence of God. I was walking along, lost in my thoughts, when from one moment to the next, the curtain between earth and heaven disappeared, and I found myself in the presence of God, very knowingly in the presence of God, seeing my life as I would see it after death, looking back over my life in the presence of God. I saw how I would feel about everything after I died. I saw that my two greatest regrets after I died would be number one, all of the time and energy I had wasted worrying about not being loved when every moment of my existence I was held in an ocean of love greater than I ever imagined could exist. And the other great regret would be every hour I had wasted doing nothing of value in the eyes of heaven. I saw that it's all true. I saw that we live forever. I saw that every action has a moral content that's observed and recorded for all eternity, that's weighed in the balance, that every time we do something of value in the eyes of heaven, we will very literally be rewarded for it for all eternity. Every opportunity we let slip will be a lost opportunity for all eternity. And the most profoundly moving aspect of this experience was coming into the full experience and certainty and knowledge that God himself, the God who had created everything that exists and actually created existence itself, not only knew me by name, not only had arranged absolutely everything that had ever happened to me to be the most perfect thing that could be arranged, um, not only um, knew about everything that happened to me and controlled everything that happened to me, but knew about how I felt at every moment of my existence and cared about how I felt at every moment of my existence, such that everything that made me happy in a very real sense made him happy, and everything that made me sad made him sad. And coming into that knowledge just completely turned my life upside down. I went back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Harvard is, after this experience, happier than I had ever been. I knew there was never any reason to be anxious about anything. I knew that absolutely everything that happens is the most perfect thing that can be arranged. I knew that we live forever. I knew that every moment has this infinite depth of meaning because it, um, if nothing else, has the potential to do something of value to God for which we will be rewarded for all eternity. But I didn't know who this God was and what religion to follow. Uh, which was at this point all I cared about was to know who this God was and what religion to follow to worship and serve him properly. So, um, I, and I couldn't think of this as the God of Judaism and this religion as, as Judaism, which if you read the Old Testament, it's obvious that the picture of God that emerges from the Old Testament is of a God far more distant and judgmental and severe than this God was. And that's not only a distortion, it's not a distortion at all in the Old Testament, it's because God really was much more distant. It's one of the reasons the incarnation took place, it's one of the reasons Jesus came. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament in Joel uh, where the Lord says, the day is coming, says the Lord, where you won't go to this person and that person and say, tell me about God, but I will make myself known to the lowliest manservant and maidservant among you. And in fact, this prophecy was quoted by St. Peter in the first Pentecost Sunday sermon um, uh, in the book of Acts. And that's exactly what happened. That's one of the things that happened when Jesus came is in, in fact, as we know, now we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now we actually have the indwelling most holy trinity. Now every human being in a state of grace has a very intimate personal relationship with God, which would not have been possible without the coming of Christ. So anyway, so um, anyway, as I said, I didn't think of this as Judaism. I prayed every night before going to sleep to know the name of my Lord and God and Master who had revealed himself to me. A year after that first experience, I went to sleep. I thought I was woken by hand, gently on my shoulder, and led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. And I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. When I found myself, oh, let me just say, I thought I was awake. My memory represents it as though I was awake. Um, I, I was absolutely convinced I was awake at the time. I now understand that I wasn't. I was physically asleep, and if there was a camera in the room, it would have shown me asleep in bed. But I can only describe it as I experienced it, which is as though I was awake. Um, so when I found myself in her presence, all I wanted to do actually was throw myself on my knees and somehow honor her appropriately. I was absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, not, I'm attempt to say not even primarily by her physical beauty, which is perfect, but by the love that flowed from her, 
to be in the presence of the purity and the intensity of the love that flowed from her was to be lifted up into a state of ecstasy greater than I ever imagined could exist. And um, as soon as I was in her presence, the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. And when she spoke, um, even more striking than her visual beauty was the beauty of her voice. And the only way I can describe it is to say her voice was composed of that which makes music music. And when she spoke, this incredibly beautiful voice just flowed straight through me, carrying with it her love and lifting my soul up into the state of ecstasy. Anyway, the, my first thought when I found myself in her presence was, oh my goodness, I wish I at least knew the Hail Mary so that I could somehow honor her appropriately. Uh, I didn't know the Hail Mary. So when she said she would offer any question I might have for her, um, I kind of wanted to ask her to teach me the Hail Mary, but I was too proud to admit that I didn't know it. So as an indirect way I, of getting her to teach me the Hail Mary, I asked her what her favorite prayer to her was. Her initial response was a little bit coy. It was, I love all prayers to me. But I was a little bit pushy. Uh, maybe it was my background um, for many reasons, including being a Harvard professor. Anyway, so uh, I said, but you must love some prayers to you more than others. And she relented and she recited a prayer to me. It was in Portuguese. I didn't know any Portuguese. So all I could do was make the effort to remember the first few words phonetically. And the next morning when I woke up, I wrote them down phonetically. Later, when I met a Portuguese Catholic woman, to the best of my ability, I identified the prayer as, O oh Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us, have recourse to thee. I asked her about uh, five or six other questions. And um, I'll mention three of them. Uh, there were really only three kind of good questions. The others were either personal or, or silly. But most of the questions came out of being overwhelmed by being in her presence, by being overwhelmed by who she was. In fact, in this experience, I could somehow see how she was the conduit, that she was the pipeline, so to speak, between divinity and humanity, and how all of the gifts and graces that flow from divinity into humanity flow through the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I could see that in this experience. Most of my questions, as I said, came out of just being overwhelmed by who she was. So at one point I said to her, I asked her, it was really more of an exclamation than a question. I said, how can it be, how is it possible? How can it be that you're so magnificent, that you're so glorious, that you're so exalted? How can it be? And her response was just to look down at me almost with pity and shake her head gently and say, oh no, you don't understand. You don't understand anything. I'm nothing, I'm a creature, I'm a created thing, he's everything. And then again, out of a desire to honor her somehow appropriately, I asked her what title she liked best for herself. And her reply was, I am the beloved daughter of the father, mother of the son, and spouse of the spirit. As I said, I asked her a few more questions. Um, which she graciously answered. Then she said she had something she wanted to talk to me about. Um, she spoke for another 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, then the audience was ended. And I usually don't say this, but I'll actually confess what ended the audience was I began to worship her. Uh, I, it's hard to describe, but the movement in my heart became one of worship. And uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't tolerate that. She couldn't stand that. And, and when my heart began to worship her, she just kind of withdrew and said, basically, you know, I can't stay here if you're going to do that. And, and she pulled away. Um, and now, in my defense, I'll say that we know, like the Apostle John in the New Testament, when an angel appeared to him, his immediate reaction was to throw himself on his face and begin to worship the angel until the angel said, no, 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 that's not appropriate. I'm a creature like you. Get up. And we know the Blessed Virgin Mary is the queen of angels, that she's more exalted than the highest of the angels. So how much more natural would it be for the human response to her glory to be to begin to worship her? However, she made it perfectly clear twice over, right, that and especially in that first question and answer, that she is nothing because everything that she is, which is so glorious and so magnificent, is a gift of God. I mean, it's a product of God. It's nothing that she owns or nothing that she has brought about by herself. 
and she in herself is just a creature. So all of the glory that we give her flows straight to God. Maximilian Kolbe has a quote, which I have in front of me, but I'm not gonna read it, that you know, if you see a beautiful statue and you admire the statue, you're giving glory to the sculptor. You're not giving glory to the statue, right? Because the statue is the work of the sculptor. And when we give glory and praise to the Blessed Virgin Mary, it just flows straight through to her author, essentially, to God. Because in her purity, needless to say, she keeps nothing for herself. She lets everything flow straight through. But anyway, I want to get to the main topic of the talk, which is, as I said, she, um, when I asked her what title she liked best for herself, she said, I am the beloved daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, spouse of the Spirit. Now we know that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the mediatrix of all graces. We don't know this because I thought I saw this in this experience, of course. We know it by the teaching of saints and popes throughout the last 1,500 years, let's say. It hasn't been formally defined as a, as a freestanding dogma, but it has certainly been dogmatically established by uh, many papal documents and papal statements, and, I'll just, and, and also words of saints, and I'll just read a few of these now. Uh, Bernard, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, God has willed that we should have nothing that, except that which passes through the hands of Mary. Saint Alphonsus Liguori, God who gave us Jesus Christ wills that all graces that have been, that are, and will be dispensed to men until the end of the world through the merits of Jesus Christ should be dispensed by the hands and through the intercession of Mary. Pope Benedict XVI, Mary is like a celestial stream through which the flow of all graces and gifts reach the soul of all wretched mortals. Pope Pius IX, Saint Pope Pius IX, Quote, for God has committed to Mary the treasury of all good things in order that everyone may know that through her are obtained every hope, every grace, and all salvation. Pope Leo XIII, nothing of all of the immense treasury of every grace which the Lord accumulated is imparted to us except through Mary. Pope St. Pius X, um, from the community of will and suffering between Christ and Mary, she became most worthily the dispenser of all of the gifts that our Savior purchased for us by his death and his blood. The source is Jesus Christ, but Mary is the channel, if you will, the neck by which the body is joined to the head and by which the head sends power and strength through to the body. Um, and on and on and on and on, many, many, many other quotes of saints and popes in papal documents. So we know that Mary is the mediatrix of all graces, that all of the graces that flow from divinity into humanity flow through the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, the tendency is to think that that is um, her prerogative, so to speak, that that honor is given to her because she is the mother of God, because she is the mother of Christ. That is a perfectly reasonable conclusion. But uh, another way of looking at it, which um, has some support, especially from St. Maximilian Kolbe, is that Mary's prerogatives, that her, her privileges, her role, come not only from her role as the mother of God, but also from her role as the spouse of God. Because Mary is not only the mother of Christ, she's also the spouse of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and she conceived Jesus in her womb, we know, and I will be delicate in this, we know what produces a conception in the womb. It is the spousal act. It is an act between spouses that produces a conception. When Jesus was conceived in Mary's womb through the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, that was a spousal act, albeit, of course, a purely spiritual spousal act. In fact, in Judaism, the thing that results in marriage is not a ceremony, it's not a contract, it's not anything done by a rabbi. The only thing that produces marriage in, in Judaism, actually, is the spousal act, which is the act that results in the two participants being spouses. When Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit, that was a spousal act, and for all eternity now, she is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't believe me, of course, but let me read some quotes of St. Maximilian Kolbe to that effect. Um, 
the Holy Spirit is in Mary after the fashion, one might say, in which the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Word, is in his humanity. There is, of course, this difference. In Jesus, there are two natures, divine and human, but some, one single person who is God. Mary's nature and person are totally distinct from the nature and person of the Holy Spirit. Still, their union is so inexpressible and so perfect that the Holy Spirit only acts by the Immaculata, his spouse. This is why she is the mediatrix of all graces given by the Holy Spirit. Um, united to the Holy Spirit as his spouse, the Immaculata is one with God in an incomparably more perfect way than can be said of any other creature. What sort of union is this? It is above all an interior union, a union of her essence with the essence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in her, lives in her. The Immaculata is united to the Holy Spirit so closely that we cannot really grasp this union, but we can at least say that the Holy Spirit and Mary are two persons who are in such intimate union that they have but one soul life. Our Heavenly Father is the source of all that is. Everything comes from the Blessed Trinity. We cannot see God, and so Jesus came to this earth to, him, to make him known to us. The most blessed Virgin Mary is the one in whom we venerate the Holy Spirit, for she is his spouse. The third person of the Blessed Trinity never took flesh. Still, our human, spirit, our human word spouse is far too weak to express the reality of the relationship between the Immaculata and the Holy Spirit. We can say that she is, in a certain sense, the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that we love in her, and through her, we love the Son. So what St. Maximilian Kolbe is saying in here, in this statement, is, of course, we cannot see God the Father. It is extremely hard to imagine what God the Father is like. One of the fruits of Jesus coming to earth, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity coming to earth as a person, is that through Jesus we can see God the Father. We can have a tangible image, so to speak, through which to relate to God the Father. In the same way, it is very hard to have a tangible image uh, to relate, through which to relate to the Holy Spirit. It's hard to have something to grasp onto to establish a relationship with the Holy Spirit. In taking Mary as his spouse and in Mary being joined to the Holy Spirit in this incomprehensible union, we have a, a more tangible way of relating to the Holy Spirit through his spouse, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I have, I mean, I have ten, probably ten more minutes of these quotes from Colby. I'll, I'll, I'll read a few of them. Um, it, they present one picture, so there's probably no need to read all of them. In the union of the Holy Spirit with the Blessed Virgin Mary, not only do we have the love of two beings, in one of the two we also have all of the love of the Trinity itself, and in the other, we have all of creation's love. So in the Holy Spirit, we have all of the love of the Most Holy Trinity. In Mary, we have the love of all of creation. Hence, in this union, heaven and earth meet, all of heaven with all of earth, the totality of divine eternal love with the fullness of created love. And so the union between the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit is the true summit of love. It's like the climax of all love because it's the union of all of created love, which is in the Blessed Virgin Mary in her purity, and all of divine love, which is in the Holy Spirit. Um, why did she call herself, I am the Immaculate Conception at Lourdes? She didn't say, I was immaculately conceived, but when Bernadette asked her, who should I say that you are? She said, I am the Immaculate Conception. This was St. Maximilian Kolbe's answer. If among human beings the wife takes the name of her husband because she belongs to him, is one with him, becomes equal to him, and is with him the source of new life, with how much greater reason should the name of the Holy Spirit, who is the divine Immaculate Conception, be used as a name of her in whom he lives as uncreated love, the principle of life in the whole supernatural order of grace. Isn't that beautiful? So the Blessed Virgin Mary said, I am the Immaculate Conception, okay? 
not I was immaculately conceived, but I am the immaculate conception because the Holy Spirit is the ultimate immaculate conception and she's married to him, so she took his name, okay? Um, and I'll just finish with um, two more quotes, okay? It's hard to stop. The creature most completely filled with love, filled with God himself, was the Immaculata who never contacted the slightest stain of sin, who never departed in the least from God's will, United to the Holy Spirit as his spouse, she is one with God in an incomparably more perfect way than can be said of any other creature. Imagination leads us to think of God the Father, of Jesus, of the Immaculata, as the objects of devotions which are more or less parallel. Instead, we should think of them as links in a single chain, as elements all leading to a single goal, God who is one in the Most Holy Trinity. Day by day, let us strive to belong more and more to the Immaculata, and in her and through her, to Jesus and to God. Never should we try to go to Jesus without her. We do not serve God the Father and Jesus our Lord and the Immaculata. Rather, we seek to serve God in Jesus and through Jesus, and to serve Jesus in the Immaculata and through the Immaculata. So in our devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, in our prayer to her, in our relationship to her, we are not um, serving her, we are not belonging to her as the end of the chain, so to speak, but it is a chain that leads through the Blessed Virgin Mary to Jesus and to God the Father. And as she is the conduit of of uh, the grace that flows from divinity into humanity. She is the conduit that takes our love of God, our worship of God, up from humanity and back into divinity in the reverse direction, so to speak, uh, which is through the Blessed Virgin Mary, through Jesus, and up to the Most Holy Trinity. So that's it. Um, thank you, and it's been a, a great honor. And um, I, uh, thank you very much.